Good afternoon and a very warm welcome from uh, Kiev uh, on this gloriously sunny uh, July afternoon. Uh, welcome from uh, central Kiev for this event, uh, Naftohaz, What Next? And we are absolutely delighted to have um, a stellar panel here uh, with us in this room uh, this afternoon, and also uh, a great list of experts joining us uh, via Zoom from across the world. Um, here in Kiev, we have the CEO of uh, Naftohaz, uh, Andriy Kobelev. We have uh, Olena Zerkal, who is advisor to the CEO. Uh, we have uh, Otto, uh, Otto uh, Wanderlander, the chief operating officer, or some call him the chief uh, transformation officer. And we have uh, Peter, uh, Peter Van Drill, the CFO, the chief financial officer. Uh, what next is really the question that everyone's asking. Uh, we find ourselves in the midst of a global pandemic with uh, over 11 million cases of confirmed cases of uh, COVID, uh, over half a million deaths. Uh, here in Kiev, we are over a thousand deaths. So the, the COVID pandemic, we find ourselves in the midst of, we find ourselves in the midst of an economic crisis, uh, with a global economic crisis uh, on the threshold of which we stand. Here in Ukraine, we look, we're looking at about uh, GDP contraction of 8.2% this year. So a big hit for the economy and for the energy markets. Um, you know, we've been at, sat at home for nearly two, for, for four months. We haven't been using our cars. Uh, we haven't been burning any petrol. Uh, and uh, what effect has this had on the global energy markets with prices going up and down? And this has a big effect on, on all of us, all our lives. So today, the purpose of this um, uh, session is really to understand what next, and uh, who better to answer these questions than the, uh, the four individuals that you can see on your screens uh, now, uh, who will be open also to take your questions. So we will be having uh, questions. The session will be in English, but we also have a simultaneous Ukrainian. So on your YouTube page, which you're watching, there is a link to watch uh, in Ukrainian. So vitaimo vsih, kto nas devitsia ukrajinskoj mowju. Um, and uh, looking forward to two hours of um, great presentations and feedback from a list of experts across the, the globe. So a very warm welcome to you. And um, let's start with a very short video. Naftogaz is a vertically integrated group of businesses operating across the entire oil and gas value chain. We explore more to find new gas fields for energy independence of our future generations. Naftogaz is Ukraine's leading gas producer, accounting for almost three quarters of domestic production. Our mission as the biggest importer and local market maker is to bridge the Ukrainian and European gas markets. We facilitate the liberalization of the gas market and drive innovations in gas supply to provide best services at fair price. Our midstream business ensures reliable transportation of oil and LPG to international and domestic customers. Meeting the country's demand, Naftogaz brings new refining technology to manufacture more Euro 5 fuels. Considering the current oversupply in the European gas market, we offer our free storage capacity to international traders. Smart technical solutions and international partnerships are key to increasing output at both existing and new fields. Getting ready for the decarbonized future, we're chasing winds and the sun to diversify Ukraine's energy basket. Through effective partnership with the private sector, Naftogaz can deliver even more energy to fuel the Ukrainian economy. We know how to bring comfort to every home. 
and we prove it to our customers every winter season, no matter what. With the free market, our energy services will become more available. Warmly yours, Naftogaz. So this afternoon's session, we'll, we'll divide it into four separate panels. The first panel will be about reform, about reform of the completion of Ukraine's gas market reform. And the keynote presenter will be the CEO, uh, Andriy Kobolev. We will also have interventions from um, Andriy Zhupanin, who is a member of parliament on the Energy Committee, uh, Servant of the People, member of parliament from the Verkhovna Rada of Ukraine. Uh, Yanis Kopach, who is the director of the Energy Community Secretariat. And uh, Torsten uh, Wollert, who is the team leader for energy, environment, uh, the support group for Ukraine in the European Commission. So on that note, um, Andriy Kobolev, uh, welcome. It is good to see you. Tell us, I think the Naftogaz story over the last five years has been a tremendous story. Uh, the reforms, tell us what next. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you for participation and uh, thank you for all guests for being here with us today. Um, I believe that uh, most of uh, audience know what difficult, on one hand, but also fruitful path NAFTA gas and Ukraine as a country uh, has gone through for the last six years. Uh, there were many victories, uh, there are many difficulties, uh, but uh, I believe that gas market reform uh, is a challenge which still remains outstanding, unfortunately, uh, and uh, I hope very much that this year may become a year when uh, the last elements of our market deficiencies, or as we call them, in of the gas, to some extent, gas market slaveries, uh, will be removed uh, both from NAFTA gas and from Ukrainian households as consumers. Uh, as you know, in industrial segment, gas is freely traded between suppliers and consumers. There is open, transparent, and I would say pretty efficient competition, which has led to uh, transparent and market-based pricing. This year, market forces have even created something which Ukrainian gas market did not see uh, before 2019, and that's the effect of decoupling. Uh, so prices uh, in Ukrainian ga uh, gas market have declined lower compared to, gas, uh, to import parity. Uh, all these circumstances, uh, I am strongly convinced, allow us to believe that full launch of proper gas market for households is something which can be and should be achieved this year. And in this uh, aspect, uh, state-owned company, Nafta Gas, will also play a critically important role. That role can be seen from several aspects. Firstly, Nafta Gas can help all market participants if there is any way of market failure. So Martha Gas will simply become, to some extent, an insurance that everybody in this market has access to gas at fair and transparent pricing. Nafta Gas will remain the way we currently are, one of the main uh, market makers, meaning that we will also ensure that market forces in terms of price setting are working effectively, no distortion is occurring. Uh, we also will uh, help our consumers uh, overcome high energy bills by introducing energy efficiency services. I understand that under the current environment, energy efficiency has become less uh, attractive because of low gas price, but we should not only look at this year, we should look several years further. That is why being energy efficient is something that all Ukrainians need to achieve in order to achieve final goal of uh, gas independence, basically to stop importing gas. Uh, all those potential achievements, uh, I would say, are fully possible and fully doable, provided that on one hand there is political courage, courage to accept the fact that Ukrainians are totally capable and totally competent enough to make a small but important choice of who should be their supplier of gas. They are totally capable of understanding the difference in prices between different suppliers. They want to have that freedom on one hand. On the other hand, that there are many companies, not only Naftogaz, but other market participants, who will create significant 
competition for households. And that competition will be definitely for the benefit of the final consumer because competition creates uh, proper pricing, competition creates transparency, competition gives uh, freedom of choice. Uh, all those elements are currently fully enjoyed, I repeat, by industrial consumers. And I do not see any reason why Ukrainian households should be deprived of those rights. Now, we believe that uh, the government uh, recently has made uh, a step in the right direction. A contest for supply of last resort was announced. And as far as I remember the schedule, Tomorrow, all willing participants will submit their bidding offers uh, so that the Ministry of Energy, the responsible for the contest, will be able to make final uh, decision who the winner is. That company will become supplier of last resort. Uh, and I hope, by the way, that the strongest, the best, and the most attractive for the market offer will win. We definitely, not a gas, will participate. But again, let's see who gives the best conditions. When that contest is over, then I believe the last restriction, on top of the restriction which was removed last month when the regulator allowed consumers to freely switch their suppliers, no matter if there is uh, unpaid debt or not. I think it was a very critical and very important element also of freedom. So on top of that, uh, it opens a way for full removal of PSO. And that removal, we hope, will not be extended any longer than the 1st of August. The last extension also happened next week. I believe it was a negative piece of news for the whole market because the earlier market starts uh, working for households, the better we can be prepared for the winter. Uh, now probably is the best timing uh, to do uh, market opening, and it's definitely better timing than autumn or winter. Uh, that is why all conditions are in place. And uh, I see one of the main roles of Naftogaz this year, on top of production, uh, on top of growing reserves, on top of preparation for an IPO, which will be discussed uh, to more extent by my colleagues, uh, ensuring that the final elements of gas market uh, in Ukraine are implemented, uh, and PSO is finally removed, at least as a market of households. Uh, that's our uh, big ambition. Big, but very close. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Andri. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, please do send your questions. Um, I um, uh, do encourage you to ask your questions, either in English or in Ukrainian. Uh, the Ukrainian live stream is available uh, on the link, so please do either send your questions in English or in Ukrainian. Um, but I think um, Andri mentioned the relationship with um, uh, the parliaments also, and I'm absolutely delighted to bring in at this stage uh, Andriy Zhopanin, who is the uh, member of parliament from the Servants of the People Party and on the um, Energy Committee. Uh, Andriy, it is good to see you. Yes. What, what, what's nice what, what's well. the view from um, uh, Hrushevskoho on Naftahaz? I mean, what, 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 what's, what, what are your colleagues on, uh, saying about the, the reforms? I mean, how, how will the reforms at Naftahaz continue? Well, I am now in building on Lipska, so not from maybe Rushevsko, but from Lipska Street. Uh, well, when I joined the parliament in uh, nine months ago, I had a meeting with Olga Belkova. You know, Olga dealt with all gas issues in the previous parliament. And uh, why, when I asked her why she left the Energy Committee and uh, went to Tax and Customs Committee, she told me that almost all reforms that have to be done in the gas sector were already done. So there's nothing for her you know, to do in this, in this sphere. And uh, when we talk about the gas reform, that uh, we shall uh, admit that Olga did a lot you know, to adopt and uh, to, to make this uh, law on the gas market work. And uh, she is uh, correct that there are not so many issues left after her. So um, my, my task is in, in, in this regard, it is um, not uh, such such a big deal if, if we talk about uh, about the last uh, uh, the last step in the gas reform. I mean the cancellation of PSO. Yes, and uh, our role as parliamentarians is not so huge in comparison to the role of the government. So we understand that there are few issues that have to be resolved on the level of the legislation, but they are not so critical in order to cancel the PSO. 
And uh, back in May this year, we had a round table where we discussed the key issues that are related to the cancellation of PSO. There were representatives from Energy com uh, Commission, Energy Committee, and there were representatives from USA, from Naftagas. And uh, we understood at that time that the question of, uh, of, uh, of how it is easy for the customer to change the supplier is a critical one, and it is now have been resolved by the regulator. And uh, among other issues um, and among other risks that we see uh, that might arise with the open of uh, with the openness of the market and with cancellation of PSO, it can be the increase the increase of the price for gas for the for the citizens, and that means for us as the politicians the risk that uh, the subsidies uh, that the monetary subsidies that state pays to the to the citizens who are not able to to pay for the utilities will also increase and the USA had the calculation that the price increase may be from 26 to 40 percent and um, my I, I would like to ask uh, the working group that is working with the prime minister on the cancellation of PSO to take that in mind that for, for us as a politicians, it is, you know, a, a, a very big risk that, uh, you know, uh, politicians, they are thinking about their rankings and about how society uh, takes them, you know. And uh, in, in that regard, the risk of, of high uh, prices is very important for us. And, uh, and another, another case is um, that uh, there is... As I were told on the on our roundtable, that there there are some regions with uh, uh, people mostly living in rural areas. For instance, in Odessa region, uh, almost 65 uh, percent of of people live not in cities. So, and there might be not a very good information, not enough information about uh, the uh, the new uh, the new market that is going to open hopefully on the on the first of August. So. That this is another um, another challenge in front of all people who are now pushing the market to open to make sure that all people who will who will be using the services and uh, who will be actually uh, sub the customers in the market they are well informed about the new market about the new rules of the market and about how the how the market operates in case people, some person is not paying the bills, who will be supplying the gas if it's not, it not paying the bills, how much time there is left when person can be supplied without any payments, and uh, etc. So these are very high-level uh, high risks uh, that uh, should be considered with opening of the market. Generally, I support uh, the cancellation of PSO, and uh, after our roundtable, I sent a letter to the Ministry of Energy uh, asking to remove all these risks and uh, to make sure that they are removed in time so that the market is open as soon as possible. I, as, I didn't mention any date in my letter to the minister because I, I understand that we should first focus on removing and working with the risks and then put a date when the market shall be open. Because um, as we see with the market, for instance, electricity market, there was some time when the market was not working properly. Even right now, many experts are saying that electricity market in Ukraine is not working that way as it should have been working. So um, that means I would suggest that we should learn our mistakes on how we open the electricity market and make sure that these are not these mistakes will not be repeated sure. when we open the market uh, in gas. Yeah, I think I think an interesting point you make about uh, Olya Bilkova. The first she left the committee, now she's left Parliament altogether. So uh, trying to read uh, that one. But if, if I can bring in um, Yanis Kopach from the um, uh, Energy Community Secretariat. Uh, Yanis, it, it's good to see you. We we, we miss you in Kiev. Uh, I think pre-COVID, we, we we saw you regularly here. Uh, what, what's your view? What, what, what next for, for Nafta House? Thanks for the invitation first. Uh, I also miss Kiev, but uh, it will be again uh, there. Uh, so we were dealing with Nafta Gas mostly because of unbundling. So it means not because of Nafta Gas, but because of Ukar Transgas. Uh, uh, 
And uh, uh, okay, Naftogas was a byproduct, if can, I can say so. Uh, first, I have to say that uh, unbundling uh, is not completely over. We can see that uh, there are still attempts to influence the independence of the new transmission system operator. Uh, and uh, uh, there is one topic which is common to both, to Naftogas and to transmission system operator, and this is so-called unauthorized offtake of gas, uh, by, uh, especially by uh, district heating companies. Uh, this is the, the area where Naftogas still has to play um, uh, public service obligation, uh, but uh, um, the, the distribution tariff, uh, which seemed appropriate from 1st of July on, was just decreased by the uh, regulator as a result, of course, of uh, relatively populist uh, views uh, on uh, in light of uh, local elections this year. Uh, the second thing, so Ukraine, I mean, not Naftogaz, but Ukraine as, as a state has to fine tune this uh, handling of vulnerable customers, especially related to district heating companies and unauthorized offtake of gas. Second thing which I would like to mention is establishment of gas exchange. This should be, of course, uh, in an in interest for Naftogaz as well. And it, it should be an interest for Ukraine as a whole, as a state. Um, unfortunately, despite having quite developed gas markets, wholesale gas markets, there is still no gas exchange. Um, uh, and we, together with uh, European EBRD, also European Union, are trying to assist Ukrainian colleagues to establish gas exchange as soon as possible, because this transparency is needed also for Naftogaz. Uh, uh, Naftogaz doesn't have uh, transit fees anymore, okay, only a slight portion, uh, and uh, it has to concentrate on income um, from the market. Uh, this market is uh, partially regulated, so it means underground gas storage is partially uh, not production and uh, wholesale and retail. Uh, and of course, this has challenges for the management uh, in the future. Um, uh, uh, on a long run, Naftogas will have to think how to secure a sustainable business. Uh, Europe, European Union is now uh, I would say, perhaps I'm exaggerating, saying obsessed with hydrogen. Uh, this is a, a new long-term uh, option for a green deal in Europe. And I think Ukraine could think about hydrogen as well. And in Europe, in European Union, uh, hydrogen is something with what uh, gas stakeholders are dealing mostly. Uh, and I believe uh, there could be a space and uh, opportunity for Naftogas as well. Another thing which I would like to mention is methane leakage. Uh, this is uh, a huge uh, problem uh, causing climate changes, um, and the European Union is very much aware of this. Uh, now, in the European Union, uh, Ukraine has such a problem as well. Uh, the biggest, far the biggest among our contracting parties, and uh, this shall be substantially improved. And Naftogas has the most important role in, uh, in this, um, and kind of a responsibility uh, towards Ukraine and towards the, the whole world uh, to prevent uh, methane leakage. Uh, these are few let's say, indirect uh, topics which I see uh, standing out of our work. But as I said in the beginning, uh, we are more concentrated on uh, gas transmission system operator and shall not too much deal with naphtogas, which shall become finally a normal 
uh, boring market participant <laughs> uh, uh, without much intervention of international community and national regulatory authorities. Super. Thanks. Thank you, Yanis. I think uh, a little bit of boredom is something what we uh, all uh, one day hope for, but because uh, it's just so much excitement that keeps us on our toes uh, on a regular basis. But I'd like to bring in Torsten. Torsten Willett, uh, also, Torsten, we used to see you uh, quite often in Kiev, and uh, especially uh, with the colleagues at the American Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Torsten, what's, what's the view of the, uh, the European Commission? And uh, what, what key areas are you focusing on now for Fonaftagaz? Well, of course, a lot of uh, the key areas have already been mentioned, so I will not go into this. Of course, uh, we think that it's important that the markets uh, expand and uh, start to function, and there's an exchange, and with all the transparency uh, and liquidity that brings uh, to the market, and that these markets are getting more and more interconnected with the European Union markets, so we see encouraging signs that first exports, for instance, from Ukraine are happening to Romania. And of course, the traditional links with Slovakia, Poland, Hungary, uh, they uh, need to be further developed. But there, I think we are on a, on a good way. Uh, the retail market has already been mentioned, so I will not get, go into this. But uh, still, there are some points which we also think are important uh, uh, going ahead. One is, of course, the whole question of uh, establishing a gas hub in Ukraine. We have been talking about this for quite some time. And now we see the conditions are relatively favorable to conceptualize this a bit more and to see now traders are already storing gas in, in Ukraine, in the underground storages. Uh, this is now largely linked to the gas price in Europe and these uh, very unprecedented price changes that we see. Uh, but... Uh, can we develop a more sustainable, a more long-term business uh, concept out of this so that uh, the, uh, the, uh, the operator of the underground storages becomes the core of the, of the hub, of the gas hub? And what does it take so that you have confidence, that you have all the rules in place, and that it's really efficient because these big price differentials, of course, will change over time? Um, another thing which we also uh, look at is the question of uh, Ukraine's gas uh, sustain, uh, how do you say, self-sufficiency. Uh, Ukraine has a lot of potential. You, we have been talking about increasing gas production, uh, being more transparent on licensing. Now, of course, it's a very difficult moment because the gas, gas prices are so low, but this will change. And the structures uh, to increase gas production have to be further developed. Uh, and also there, we see a lot of progress, and we would like to follow up on this. Uh, and uh, it's not only Naftogaz, but it's really a whole variety of players and hopefully a growing variety of players, including technology companies with a lot of uh, inter international expertise. And the last point, uh, maybe going even further ahead, is the whole question of, well, natural gas in reality is fossil gas, but it doesn't have to be like this. This is what a lot is now being, uh, I mean, Janis mentioned hydrogen, but also there are other ways uh, to, to defossilize gas. For instance, you can uh, look into biogas where Ukraine has started. It is now a local solution, but it, it has potential to become a, a network solution. We are now seeing a lot of developments on new technologies, power to gas, for instance, where you can produce hydrogen, you can produce methane, Ukraine has the infrastructure, Ukraine has the resources, and I think it's a big opportunity also to integrate further into the European market and to become, for specific products, an exporter to the European market. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Torsten. And uh, um, before, before uh, so please do send us your, your questions. Uh, if you can just send your questions on the, uh, on the YouTube um, uh, spaces below. Um, I'll ask um, for a question, if I may, um, Andri. I mean, lots of questions, but one question specifically uh, now about uh, corporate governance. I mean, what, what's, what can you tell us about the, the, the corporate governance? I mean, um, I think Yanis sort of touched on the populism, and, uh, but the, the whole issue of corporate governance, you know, many Western players are, are really concerned about where, where this is going. And, um, you know, together with this, what, what is your relationship, what is an Aftergas relationship with the key uh, state stakeholders? 
I would probably start from the fact that uh, most of, uh, not most of, I would say, uh, all victories, uh, all elements of success that NAFTA has achieved for the last six years, corporate governance, proper corporate governance, played vital role uh, in those achievements. And that is true for uh, diversification, that is true for unbundling, that is true for arbitrations. Uh, in all areas, corporate governance, independent supervisory board, which should and does serve as insulation of the company from political influence, uh, played hugely important role. It cannot be overestimated, I would put it this way. What we see now, unfortunately, is that uh, there is a huge wave of, um, and I, would, I wouldn't call it populism. I would say there is a big attack on corporate governance. Uh, and in my view, the attack is smartly coordinated. Uh, it is not that uh, uh, it is something coming from people of Ukraine who don't like independent directors and blah, 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 the favorite topics which are being created by opponents of corporate governance and thrown into the media. Uh, that's not true. Uh, main fighters against corporate governance are people who remember uh, old times how nice and convenient it was to make corrupt money on companies like Naftagas, on other state-owned assets. And these people simply want to go back. They believe now it's a good time. Now it's a good time to uh, use various uh, fake stories, uh, I don't know, mentioning various uh, internationally well-known people, like, for example, Mr. Soros or Bill Gates uh, and uh, other things. So this attack is well-coordinated. And unfortunately, so far, opponents have achieved uh, certain success. That success uh, is uh, introduction uh, of uh, certain levels of salaries uh, for supervisory boards and management of the companies. We all understand that people who work uh, honestly and transparently, they are working for those salaries. They don't steal. So taking any uh, and the only way they can make money, because they would not try to be corrupt, at least I hope so, and I believe so, at least in after gas for sure, uh, that leaves for some of them no choice but to leave their positions. And that is, uh, I would say, was a pretty uh, mm, well thought through attack, which managed to succeed. Uh, and that is why I would strongly ask the international community and now international stakeholders to pay big attention to this very fact. I understand how, from a populistic point of view, it's difficult to fight for market salaries in country like Ukraine, where economy is not doing very well, where a lot of people uh, are suffering from economic conditions, but it is the only way forward. And I was uh, always comparing this situation with a situation uh, with a person that has uh, some bad disease, and this person wants to have proper medical treatment. Our life shows that no matter how you want that, but all proper medical treatment comes for money. The same with corporate governance, the same as state-owned companies. If you want proper governance, you have to pay money to management who is ensuring that corporate governance. Uh, any support from international community in this respect would be hugely welcome, because if we all lose this battle, the whole war around, turnaround of state-owned entities may be lost. That is, that is what is currently at the stake. Absolutely. I think where we're seeing this, not only with uh, Nafta Gas, not only with state-owned enterprise, also state-owned banks. So uh, I think it's, uh, it is a super important uh, message. So please do continue sending your um, questions. But let's move to the finances. Um, and I'm delighted to bring in uh, Peter, Peter Van Driel, the, the uh, CFO. And then uh, joining us shortly will be from across the Atlantic, uh, Vladislav Rashkovan, uh, the alternate executive director at the IMF. But uh, Peter, the floor is yours. So uh, tell us about the, the finances. And especially, you know, Andrei mentioned the IPO. Uh, I think a lot of people will be very interested to hear what, what, what your plans are on that. Yeah, thank you for the question. Let me start with uh, the year 2019, which I think was an important year for Naftagas because we had several victories. Of course, the unbundling was important for the company, but also we managed, uh, following the arbitration case in Stockholm, to secure the receipt of 68 billion grivnas. And that is a huge success for us. We also concluded new transit agreements, which gives us stability in terms of cash flow. 
So starting the year 2020, we were actually in a good shape. And it is our job to see what the future will bring and to be prepared for a downturn. And it was no surprise to us that gas prices were falling probably more quicker than we ever anticipated. Peter, if I could just yeah. jump in there. So you started in 2020. If I can just ask for the, the very short video to introduce you, because uh, not, not everybody has uh, already Go met for you. It. So let, let, let's see. Uh, tell us about Peter. And I understand you have a presentation also. Yeah. Do you want to start with the presentation first? Whatever's best for you. Um, I think I can do it without the presentation. Okay. Um, the trick for us is to be ready for the downturn. That is what is vital for a company that is used to a cyclical behavior in the oil and gas energy. We know that gas prices over time go up and come down. And we are a company that is fortunate with a strong balance sheet. So the balance sheet is used to go through the downturn. And for the experts amongst us, our gearing at the end of 2019 was 12%. Gearing is your debt divided by your debt and your capital. That is a good number to have. It means that we have enough capacity to go out to the market, even when required, and attract additional funds. The reality is that we will go into a period, and I suspect that is more than just one year, it's likely to be more than one year, possibly three, four years even, that's what we're planning for, where prices will be depressed, and we need to be ready for that. Um, we are, at the same time, a company that is getting to ready for an IPO. That is a time frame of about three years, and we've started preparing ourselves. How do we do it? We want to be extremely transparent to the market on what NAFTA gas is. We want to be clear about our story. We want to be clear about our contribution to the state, our current shareholder. And let's not underestimate the amount of money that NAFTA gas is contributing to the state. And that is last year some 16% of the total state budget. And even this year, in form of dividends, in form of income tax, you name it, royalties, we contribute some 12% of the state budget when gas prices are low. So that transparency to the market, to the shareholder, is extremely important. We also look at uh, matters that investors find important. You spoke about corporate governance, Andre spoke about corporate governance, but it's also about how do you run the company, how's your control framework. And then the last point is about how we in society act. What is our environmental, what is our social policy, and how do we deal with the governance? Those are the points that we're watching closely, and we continue to communicate with all people who are part of Naftagas inside and outside of the company. Okay. Uh, so please do, any questions, uh, please do uh, send your questions on and we'll be delighted to, to provide answers. Let's go now across the Atlantic. Uh, Vladislav Rashkovan. Vlad, can you hear us? Can you see us? Hi, Andre. Do you hear me? I can hear you. Thanks for inviting for today. Event, you know. I, I strongly believe that Naftagas strategy and its further development is crucial for Ukraine. And again, also thanks to Andre Elena for, for inviting and uh, I mean, this is important for, for, for many different reasons. And looking also backwards, uh, uh, Naftagas team helped us to somehow believe uh, in many things. You know, first, uh, that independence of Ukraine can be won not only on the military fields, uh, but also on job in corporate offices, uh, just doing right things uh, in state agencies or state companies. And it, also, it can also won, uh, the independence can be also won in the courts as well, like Naftagas cases in Stockholm. And these actions bring, bring not only political independence, but also make the big impact on economic independence and help the public finance to be more sustainable. 
You know, second, you know, Naftagas showed the, the changes are possible. And therefore, from the state company, which created an enormous, unsustainable, macro-critical hole in the state budget prior to 2013, uh, with the uh, right management, the state company can, can emerge uh, as one of the key contributors to the state budget. And bungling is another demonstration that changes are possible, even if there are many odds against you and there are risks and enemies around. So this shows that other state companies can do it as well, and they also can change. And these changes bring us much more closer to Europe than many, many political slogans. And again, they help uh, to make the public finances more sustainable. Third, like National Bank or Prozoro, two other cases mostly quoted in the foreign media about Ukraine in the last years, Naftagas also showed that uh, uh, the um, institutions do matter. And therefore, the company's performance and success don't depend only on one person, but more on interconnection and interdependence of policies, uh, procedures, and corporate governance. And here, as already said today, also Naftagas showed that corporate governance indeed matters. Uh, and professional supervisory board composed of best uh, global experts is capable to select and protect uh, the professional management. As Andre said, it has been a vital factor which helped Naftagas to succeed in the last years. And finally, but most less important also for the public finances, you know, last year showed that the corruption can be tackled, uh, also in Ukraine, especially if you take it seriously. Corruption is not a mysterious uh, Leviathan. It's a combination of the institutional framework, people, governance, policies, and procedures. And there is an excellent place for corruption in a weak institution or state enterprise uh, where weak corporate governance, weak independent management, and weak policies. And opposite, uh, in the strong company with professional management and built-in system of internal controls, the corruption dies. And there is simply no room for it on, on systemic level. But, uh, I mean, if you allow me a few minutes more, you know, the, the topic of today's discussion is uh, what's next. And here maybe I will be not uh, or less uh, being, being a little bit less orthodox, uh, especially if we still uh, speak uh, only about like one company, state enterprise. There was a famous political leader of the past who was saying that uh, you cannot build a communism in one isolated country. Likewise, uh, you cannot build capitalism in one selected state company or public institution in Ukraine. And I was telling this uh, while working in the National Bank in 2014, 2016. And that's why I was spending like 25% of my time trying to bring other public institutions to the speed of national bank changes. Therefore, I strongly believe that, uh, you know, that the NAFTAGA should not only focus on its own development, on its own strategy, but also like, uh, like act as an example for others. Eh? And I see at least, you know, five areas uh, where it might be relevant, even if might be, they look a little bit controversial from the single company perspective. First, uh, as was already said today, is a competition. Ukraine is known by its monopolies and, uh, and low competition. And Naftagas has been a monopoly already for some time as well. Moreover, it has been born as a monopoly. But later, slowly, slowly, going for more competition, now on the level of households, as Andre was telling. And uh, this is even more important in the period when uh, local gas prices declined. Uh, this was already said today. And uh, I think Naftagas should go even deeper and do it even faster. Naftagas should embrace the competition. It should strive for competition also with foreign players. Because competition not only brings the, the benefits uh, for the consumers, but also um, uh, becomes a huge nudge for the internal transformation, especially considering Naftagas is determined for turnaround, for internal turnaround transformation. Second is, uh, you know, energy efficiency. It looks naturally that, uh, you know, a company like Naftagas should strive for more demand uh, uh, on, on its core products. But from the country perspective, from the budget perspective, from balance of payment perspective, considering that we are the country which still imports a big portion of our gas, Naftagas should be a country for, uh, front runner advocating for lower energy consumption. And so, yes, targeting the higher dividends transfer from Naftagas to state budget is important. But I think the company of the Naftagas level should, be, should bear in mind the countrywide perspective as a country, we need to decrease energy consumption, which will help us to secure our independence even more. But the, and, and this is also important from sustainability point of view, it has been said already. You know, I know that ecology protection is, is costly, but fixing the climate change consequences in longer term for the country and for the budget will be even more costly in long term. Therefore, Naftagas should even more, more take on the shield of the, uh, the concept of meeting sustainability. And no, corporate governance, it's what has been already said today. I do believe in a strong governance and strong institution, which, you know, help to transform the government policies into the professional corporate actions. But again, Naftagans cannot be only one company or only one of the few companies with a proper corporate governance. 
Naftegas, being as an example, should, should lead a further improvement in corporate governance in Ukraine, especially now when there is an attack on the, independent, on the corporate governance, including on the salary levels, uh, as, as Andrew just said. I mean, it should, literally speaking, I mean, going to the barricades, not only to protect the corporate governance reforms, but also to deepen it and improve it throughout the country. Because the, the cases of Nafagas, Superpost, and a few other companies show that this is very beneficial for the state budget and public finance. You know, I can also say that we need also to look at the energy policy in the consolidated and holistic way. But I know that these five elements, you know, dealing with energy system as a whole, not only on the gas, embracing competition, striving for energy efficiency, advocating for sustainability, and pushing forward the corporate governance reform looks like a little bit beyond the mandate of NAFTA gas as a single company. But I really strongly believe that this should complement the targets which NAFTA gas has already in, in strategy. And this is, is for me, what's Super. next for, for NAFTA gas. Well, it is, it is good. It's always good I'm to Sophia. hear you. Always good to see Thanks. you and uh, hope to see you soon. So um, just, just, I mean, we're starting to get a few questions in, and I think we'll take some of them now. We'll take some at the end. Um, just going back to the IPO, I mean, any more details you can share? I mean, where, which bits, um, what, what, what can you say at this stage? So we are actively working the IPO. It means that we engage with banks. So we got uh, uh, investment banks uh, ready for uh, the next steps. Um, what we're working on is, as I said, is this control framework is the first step to get the house in order. The next step will be for us then to be very clear to the market. What is an investor investing in? What is it he or she is buying? and the clarity around what is the equity story for Naftogaz. In parallel, and I fully agree with what has been said before, we need to be very clear on how we do in terms of sustainability, social governance. All ESG aspects are extremely important for the community. And let's be honest, oil and gas is not flavor of the month of investors. So by just going out to the market with a story around just hydrocarbons, I doubt whether it will attract enough attention from the investment community. So for us, it is important to have a pathway to the transition. The energy transition is here. We should not uh, look away from it. It will provide us with many opportunities. And for us, it's important to be clear how that transition will look like. It's not going to happen overnight. We will rely for a long time on hydrocarbons. But at the same time, we must have our strategy in parallel to that, communicated to the market. So I think that is what we're doing. What is Naftogaz about? What does our future look like? And how will investors play a role in all of that? Brilliant. Well, thank you, uh, Peter. Thank you, Vlad. So moving on to our third panel now, in cr uh, creating business opportunities for the European gas market. And Olena, Lana Zerkal, uh, advises the CEO. And uh, we'll have um, interventions from uh, Aura Sabados, who is a uh, journalist at uh, ICIS, the Independent Commodity Intelligence Services. Simon Pirani, who's a senior research fellow at the Oxford Institute for Energy Studies. And Edward Chow, senior associates for this at the Center of Strategic and International Studies. So, uh, Lana, tell us about the, the business opportunities for, for the European gas markets. Uh, <clears throat> I think that this kind of intervention has already been started by Torsten, who just mentioned that we should think about the future of Ukraine and to create the gas hub in Ukraine. So actually we see in this direction for years, and now we are on the stage where we are forming our business case concerning the opportunities. How do we see this market integration? And if I may, I would rather say that the efforts we made before with European Commission concerning uh, the way how we see uh, our regulatory approximation and the increase of our market integration give us a lot of opportunities and bring us closer to this competitive market. So we strive for competition because we do see the future in European Union. And we hope that we will manage to convince European Commission in necessity to create a kind of pilot project in a gas sphere and to start our market integration from this particular market. 
because we mostly align to our legislation. We are very advanced in this sphere, and I think that this kind of common work can show further that for us European integration is not only a word, that we do think about our opportunities, and that your Ukrainian market is also full of opportunities for the European companies. And we do think that next steps will be, of course, this uh, transfer of entry points from our eastern border, from our western border to our eastern border. And that how can we achieve further integration and that how we show for the European companies that they can benefit from this. And definitely, if you will look at the map, which should be shown on the screen, you will see that today the European market is quite fragmented. And despite the fact that the main goal of the European market is to have this full integration, for instance, Poland now has connection only with one of the neighbors. At the same time, uh, the developments we have here in Ukraine and the new contract with Gazprom uh, gives us an opportunity to talk about, yes, you may see here that Ukraine has the huge potential with the gas storages and uh, the possibility to chain the north of the Europe with the south of the Europe and to make the possible all these gas flows easily come from this north and goes to the south and vice versa. So that's an opportunity we can offer to our European colleagues. And we do think that it may create a new reality for the market, but we also consider our future as a kind of uh, mm, business partner in a hydrogen strategy for Europe. We think that we need to, to think more closely and to consider more the necessity to implement uh, the Green Deal in Ukraine. And of course, energy efficiency is one of our options where we see that we may play a considerable role here in Ukraine as a responsible partner and as the responsible social partner. But of course, as I mentioned, our market is already an open market, and we hope that we will attract even more partners here in Ukraine in our gas storage, underground gas storages, but also in our business as well. Okay. Well, uh, many people in, in Ukraine here, we know you very well from both your work across the roads at uh, the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs. We have a very, very short um, video, if, if I can just ask to just uh, for those uh, viewers across the globe that are watching us just to, to get more transparency on who this team is. So if you can just show the, um, uh, the video about Lana and her, her background and uh, um, many years. But I think the storage you mentioned, the storage is, is something, um, I think there will be questions on that. So I think we, we can come back to that because I think that that's something um, uh, we, we have been um, uh, you know, looking at and I think the changes that are happening, uh, especially the numbers in the storage. So if we don't have the, um, uh, the video now, then um, I will then uh, ask to bring in um, our um, uh, next speaker and um, I would ask to bring in uh, Aura. Uh, Aura Sabados from the um, Independent Commodity Intelligence Services. Uh, Aura, good uh, afternoon. Can you hear us? Yes, I can indeed. Thank you very much for, uh, for introducing me. Uh, and thank you for the opportunity to, to join this timely discussion. Um, of course, I believe that the title of this session, Creating Opportunities in the European Market, can be read either way for NAFTA gas creating opportunity for NAFTA gas to enter the European markets, but also for European companies to enter um, Ukraine and, of course, to um, work jointly with NAFTA gas in Ukraine. Um, there are a few points that I would like to raise here. In fact, three three um, areas that, that NAFTA gas could focus on um, and which I think are of interest. So first of all, NAFTA gas, if, if we're talking about exiting the, the Ukrainian market and, and expanding in Europe, um, there are opportunities for NAFTA gas to invest all along the value chain, 
uh, chain, upstream, downstream, and uh, midstream. So upstream, I think Romania would be uh, a prime candidate. Uh, you are probably all aware of the fact that um, ExxonMobil is in the process of exiting the market and share and selling uh, its 50% share. Um, so th there are two companies that are in the race right now. We're talking Poland's Picnic and um, Romania's Romgas. I see no harm in Ukraine in Naftogaz either joining this uh, team or bidding solo, going solo in the race. Um, the, the, the block is quite close to the um, to the Trans Transbalkan pipeline, which has historically uh, been a, a, a main transit route for Russian gas to the Balkans and to Turkey. Uh, so with minor infrastructure um, investments, the gas could be easily taken into the pipeline and shipped either north to Ukraine and Moldova or to the, Ukra to the Romanian market or to the Balkans. Um, then I also see opportunities for NAFTA gas in investing in, in midstream because NAFTA gas, let's face it, it's the, um, the, the operator of Europe's largest stor storages, right? So, for example, right now there is a, a tender for a 50-year concession in Greece for the South Kavala uh, Reservoir um, for, to, to operate this, uh, this um, storage facility. And uh, this, is, this project is uh, included in, the, in Europe's project of common interest. Um, so that's midstream. Uh, in terms of downstream, I think uh, Sokar could be a really interesting case study in the sense that Sokar is, a, is, is an upstream company, but it has also expanded in, uh, in downstream. And, and uh, we see that Sokar has a trading floor in, in Geneva, as far as I remember. Uh, Picnic as well, for example, the Polish company has a, trade, a, um, a trading desk in, in London, trading LNG. So, and I think the time has now come for NAFTA gas to become a big trader in Europe and to take an important position, not only in gas trading, but also in oil trading. Um, and why not? As, as Ukraine, as NAFTA gas is cutting its teeth in retail in, in Ukraine, I think it's also a good opportunity to enter the retail market in, in the region. Now, I've just mentioned the, the, the three areas of investment that could be interesting for Naftogaz. The other interesting point, and again, you've, you've already mentioned the idea of a storage hub, a trading hub. I've covered emerging markets for the last 10 years, and all of them wanted to be hubs. So I'm, I'm a little bit uh, skeptical about using that word. But I think Ukraine does have an, a good opportunity to become a storage hub, for sure. And that's backed up by the recent financial law that has just been um, passed to create the necessary tools to minimize risk uh, and, and to encourage more companies to join. Um, and also a trading hub, why not? Because Ukraine and, and NAFTA gas has been um, quite an active player on the, on the local exchange. If we see OTC trading develop and developing in Ukraine, um, NAFTA gas may also join. And in the future, why not? Uh, Ukraine could become um, a sort of central regional market um, and all the other regional smaller markets could gravitate around it. So quite an interesting opportunity opening up for Ukraine. And finally, very quickly, um, I think that NAFTA gas is also in the position to share uh, knowledge uh, because Ukraine has been very, very um, good in staying focused on reform as, <clears throat> as far as the, the gas market is concerned. Again, as I said, I've been covering emerging markets for the last 10 years and many of the regional markets that started well before uh, Ukraine are now lagging behind Ukraine. Um, so I think that it's a good opportunity for Ukraine and for NAFTA to make a, a, a good name in the region, to work with countries like Moldova or even European countries like Romania, Bulgaria or Turkey, which have been in the process of, of reforming but uh, have stalled. So I stop here and thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you, Aura. Uh, if I can bring in Simon Pirani, uh, who's the Senior Research Fellow at uh, the Oxford Institute for Energy uh, Studies. Simon, can you hear uh, us? Uh, hey, yes, hello, uh, Andy. Yeah, and uh, thank you very much for... Uh, bringing me onto the call. Um, hello from the UK. Um, so I've got three uh, groups of questions which I hope will uh, contribute to the discussion. Um, the first is about storage. Uh, a couple of people have already mentioned it. Um, as far as we can see, the arrangement, the customs warehouse uh, arrangement has been a big success. And NAFTA gas reacted quite swiftly to a very unusual situation where we had an already oversupplied 
European market, storages in Europe uh, getting uh, unusually full towards the end of last year. And then, of course, the effect of the coronavirus pandemic added to that. But these are unusual uh, circumstances. So are we not just going to revert to this, the situation as it was before, where Ukrainian storage would struggle uh, because of geographic position, because of the amount of storage in Central and Eastern Europe uh, to compete and to make this a really uh, thriving business. So how can how competitive can those uh, storage facilities be over the longer term? I'd be very interested to hear uh, the management's view on that. Uh, second, um, political risk. Um, I think any, just judging by the sort of phone conversations I've been having and uh, the sort of things that people are saying in the European market, uh, Ukraine is still perceived as as having big elements of political risk. Um, the dismissal of Walter Boltz uh, highlighted this uh, from uh, MGU. Um, that certainly got my phone line uh, buzzing. Obviously, this has nothing to do with NAFTA gas formally or directly, but I, I think it's relevant in two ways. First of all, it forms part of the context of the market in which you're inviting companies to work. This is also a market where we've seen uh, the resignation of the central bank governor uh, last week, and people are bound to ask themselves, what is it about competent technocrats that they keep disappearing uh, from the scene like this? And obviously, you're, you're asking people to partner you in Ukraine. Uh, you, you need to have a view on this. Secondly, um, some of the commentary on Mr. Boltz's dismissal focused on the fact that it happened on the same day as this uh, interesting challenge to unbundling, which went to the Constitutional Court, and the fear was expressed publicly that Russian forces influenced these events, and uh, they might even provide a pretext for uh, Gazprom to challenge the terms of or annul uh, the transit contract, and that is obviously a contract with NAFTA gas. Now, I think those versions of events uh, strain credibility. I don't share that view uh, about what happened. I find it difficult to believe. But these claims have been made publicly. And uh, this is the contract with Gazprom is a NAFTA gas contract. So it'd be, it'd be really good to hear uh, the company's view on that. Um, third group of issues is about uh, the domestic market. People have already spoken on the call about how uh, things are moving along. Uh, we've heard about the public service obligation and, and the difficulty which uh, I think Ukraine shares with all uh, transition economies in uh, moving away from that uh, because of the impact uh, the, the, um, Mr. Shupanyin uh, referred to the impact on house, individual households. And obviously, we're living through very difficult economic circumstances. Um, I, I, I'd be grateful for an update on... Uh, another aspect of the same problem, which is the district heating companies and the regional supply companies. Uh, I know that Andre uh, said in uh, October last year, talking about this enormous volume of debt, 38 billion hryvna at that time. Now, a lot of that now sits with uh, GTSOU, I think. But uh, this is not a problem from which NAFTA gas is, is separated. And uh, I, 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 it's good to see... Uh, executives talking about uh, moving in and competing uh, in the individual supply market. But uh, where, where are we with these regional supply companies and the regulation of those companies and uh, the district heating companies? And the final, just quick one, um, is about electricity generation. I, I had not seen electricity generation as a, a, an opportunity for uh, the gas business in Ukraine to expand further than the share that already has uh, in Kiev and uh, with some of the CHPs. But I, I noticed that the sales for electricity generation, uh, the company reported that they rose uh, near 44 percent, I think it was, between 2018 and 2019. It's a big increase. I think some units have switched from anthracite to gas because of uh, the events in the East. Uh, th that's my understanding. But how competitive is gas with coal uh, and renewables, for that matter, in the electricity sector? Is that a, a, an opportunity for expansion or is that a sort of one-off event uh, in the East? Um, and, and uh, you know, is gas limited for all the reasons we know? 
uh, for electricity. So uh, th 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 those are questions, perhaps, uh, from me, but I think they're questions that will be in the minds of, of uh, companies with which uh, you're hoping to work and, and uh, political people in Europe. So I hope I've reflected something useful which you can pick up on. Simon, that's brilliant. Absolutely. I think uh, four areas of real uh, uh, good questions to focus on. Um, I guess that some of them maybe we'll have in the next presentation. So what, what maybe we'll do, I'll, I'll keep a list of the questions and we'll answer them to, to the end. Uh, at the end, sorry. So, I mean, if we, we can sort of kick off our, our fourth panel, but I, I do promise, Simon, that we will get back to your questions and Aura also. So thank you for, for a really great intervention. I think uh, super uh, important uh, topics. So Otto, before we start, let's introduce Otto. It's great to see you. Uh, just uh, very briefly, on this panel also we'll have uh, Roman Opimach, who is the chairman of the state's uh, geology and subsoil survey, service, Timothy Ash, an economist from uh, Blue Bay Asset Management in London, and Serhi Fursa, uh, debt management security specialist at uh, Dragon Capital. Um, but Otto, um, I see the title there is chief operating officer. Some call you the chief transformation officer. Uh, tell us. Uh, and. Would you like to show your presentation, or what, what, how, how best do you want to take this forward? We can use a couple of the uh, slides. Um, uh, we made uh, a bit of an overview, but really the transformation officer and the operating officer come actually very close together. And in particular now that we are in this crisis uh, situation, since the, uh, the first quarter, uh, it is clear that our transformation is no longer a desire to make the group more efficient, a desire to get the group more uh, business focused, but it's actually a necessity. So for us, not transforming is no longer an option. So we have to move all of our businesses, and that's also why we decided to integrate those roles and to make it, uh, give it more of an edge and actually accelerate the transformation, uh, rather than have it two sort of uh, activities next to each other. The transformation really, and there's some of the points that are here that uh, are our priorities, but the transformation really is around making the group more efficient first and foremost, ensuring that we have um, affordable capital investments, making sure that essentially that we are doing more with the same amount of money and that we're actually more efficient also in our capital investments. We also need to make sure that we have more business focus. So one of the uh, activities we did, we drove down our integrated business unit into two separate business entities that are really have separate focused uh, and uh, separate focus management teams now. And we need to get faster in decision making. Um, we're talking about, um, it was interesting to hear uh, the, the reactions back from the uh, experts in the market as well. Um, but the speed with which we, for example, managed to work on the uh, gas storage situation when we saw the opportunity in the market and work also together with the government. Those are things that cannot work with red tape. So we need to become much faster everywhere in our decision making. And that's what we're doing. And we finally, we add an element of individual accountability to that. So how do we then approach the crisis that we have in the market and how do we approach our business? First and foremost, you will not be surprised, uh, health and safety remains a huge priority for us uh, across the group. Last year, we've made a big step. We can not strive for anything less than zero fatalities. We must take all of our people home every day. Uh, that is directly for the 30,000 people that work with us, but also for the 20,000 that we have in our joint venture with Ukanafta. And it's one of our key responsibilities to, to continue working on, and we continue working on that. I will not put down uh, the amount of money. In fact, we want to actually spend more money on making sure that we're doing the right thing in there. But then what we need to do is we have actually fine-tuned our production program over the last year. In view of the market uh, pricing, we're less concerned whether or not we are exactly matching the 2019 level. We might actually come down a little bit below because we 
um, are at the same time working to reduce both our operating cost as well as our capital investment uh, program by 20%. The 20% is pretty much in line with most of the activities that we've seen by international partners. Um, and we need to, to move that down this year to further build on uh, in next year as well. It's also important because we need to free up cash um, for uh, growth of our activities. So if you look at our upstream part of the activities, I would divide them really into very distinct <laughs> activities almost. One, the brownfield, 99% uh, of our current reserves that are producing keep them producing while they're very mature um, operations, keep pushing out the decline as long and as much as we can over time. And we spent probably about two thirds of our investment budgets in making that happen. And it's still economic even under today's conditions. The other one third we actually put into the growth opportunities. The only opportunity for us to contribute to the um, supply independence for the country is by adding new reserves to the book and by taking those new reserves into production. So that's where the other activities go into, and I'll come back to that uh, point as well. Um, and then finally, we, we're working quite hard, uh, I think we laid a good, good basis in the last uh, four months, uh, to make <coughs> sure that the uh, accountabilities across divisions and across people has become much more clear, much more transparent, and this will help us um, deliver on this opportunity to speed up decision making, but also uh, create better results because we now see the opportunities either in how we operate or how we see them in the market. So those are all elements that help us ultimately, uh, as Peter would say, get IPO ready as well. There are necessities for us to actually move on. If I then show you the next slide and talk a little bit more about growth, and this is focused on the upstream, and I heard some interesting and um, known opportunities also in the discussion we had uh, before. But for us, the, the issue of greenfield, the new development of reserves, is super important. Um, since 2016, we've had uh, three do dozen uh, of new licenses. We are almost complete in evaluating those and we can take further steps. We've done a significant amount of seismic developments uh, in there. And out of that come in particular the uh, deep gas uh, developments that we are uh, pursuing at the moment. So what we are doing here, we're moving into the five, close to six kilometer, well, sometimes over six kilometer depth um, of reservoirs where we're hoping to go to the source rock formations of uh, our original fields. So for example, uh, our largest field, Shebelinka, we're now drilling deep below Shebelinka to access new horizons uh, where we expect to find uh, gas as well. Um, that is challenging, that is technically challenging, uh, and it's also economically challenging because we are moving much, much deeper. The second part is our uh, tight gas. We have some, uh, identified some of the uh, high promising unconventional uh, gas fields. We're already touching one, so we have drilled three um, uh, exploration wells into um, Sveta Gorke. Um, which is in the Skivka area, and we believe that we are able to unlock that opportunity there as well. And then thirdly, we are very keen to go back to the, um, the Black Sea. We've been there, as you know. Um, we need to go back into the Black Sea because, as we already heard before, Romania is, is having um, uh, the benefit of significant finds. Um, they're working on how to extract them with, without, uh, it looks like, without ExxonMobil. Um, we want to have our share of the Black Sea. We need to go out there. We have seen already early uh, deposits, and we think it's an Im important add-on to the reserve base that we need to grow for the country. What is important, if you, if you take this all together, and I'm not even talking yet about the growth that we see, for example, in our midstream activities where we want to further uh, expand on extracting LPGs and liquids, um, uh, condensate uh, from the gas uh, uh, production uh, on one hand and on the other hand where we're investing now into the retail and into the trading uh, business to both build out those activities. Um, they're less capital intensive but still building a retail franchise in um, Ukraine being one of the competitors in the market uh, that, a lot, that, that is here from which customers can choose um, still takes us an investment amount of money uh, to get into as well. So what do we need? Well, first of all, you will not be surprised to hear that we need a lot of uh, access to capital. Let's go to the next slide as well. 
um, we will need a lot of uh, access to capital. Um, and this year is uh, clearly a balancing act for us, where we want to, and it's important to support the government and to the country in funding the, the country through the crisis as well. Um, but going forward, we also need to be very clear that we can uh, and we must leverage the strength of our balance sheet to fund further investments, and uh, many of those investments will remain to be offshore. But what we also need to do is we need to secure the investment climate throughout the crisis that we have. Virtually every country is, is doing the same. Um, they're coming up with either accelerated depreciation rules, they're coming up with either temporary or permanent reduced royalty schemes, they can actually lower tax schemes. And if you look in the North Sea, this has been a permanent dance of adjusting the fiscal uh, takes to the levels that is necessary to continue stimulating uh, investment needs. We need to do the same, two reasons. One, we need it in the country. We need it to remain uh, robust in our investments. But two, if we really are serious, and we are serious, but to attract international partners to the country, we must make sure that the investments we're planning and we're proposing in Ukraine are at par with any of those investments that we find in other countries. We really are in competition with those, and we need to make sure that the investments that we're planning in Ukraine, also for international companies, are in the top quartile of investments that they want to invest in. Because, let's make no mistake, all of the international partners have also decreased their investments by 20-25%. Their degree of freedom in their budgets is much less and they're allocating the remaining, the scarce remaining reserves. We need to make sure that they want to come to, uh, to Ukraine as well. Um, there's good interest, by the way, from what I'm hearing from international partners, but we need to make sure that this is clear and also that we show uh, the continuity and the governance reforms that uh, Andreas already talked about. An important part here is to also make sure that we have our PSAs concluded. So last year, we um, had a PSA around production sharing agreements, um, and it's important that we conclude the final contracts as a sign not only that we are serious and we mo need to move ahead, but there's also a real risk that if we don't close this fast that we start losing potential investors. Why is this very important? Well, it's important because the investment agenda that we're just talking about is larger than uh, NAFTA gas can drive alone. So <coughs> part of what we are uh, working on at the moment, part of our new strategy is how can we reduce our capital intensity in all of those investments while we are moving on all of those funds at the same time. And part of the idea is to look at how can we go into the earlier stage of exploration, seismics, etc., and then farm in other partners when they have seen um, the, the, the reduced risk, when there's more clear what their investment levels will be and what their investments could return. So this will be a change in um, approach from Naftogas, from being a full operator and actually driving our investments 100% ourselves, to becoming increasingly a partner as well to the, those partners, and making sure that we're an orchestrator of the developments in the country. Um, together with... Um, uh, getting much better access, so the, the, l let me make a point around the procurement. We are for uh, transparent procurement, because we want to be and we have to be. We must continue driving out any areas where we see corruption in the company or actually associated around the company, and there's no discussion, there's no um, even gray zone in that area. But with the uh, government imposing uh, significant duties on imports uh, for uh, uh, imports that we need um, in our production as well, it creates an opportunity for increases of prices of domestic supplies. We want to stimulate the domestic uh, supply, we want to stimulate domestic uh, employment and activities, but by imposing significant duties, the result may well be unintended that we see increases in the prices domestically. And that would do the opposite as what we are trying to do with our transformation, driving down the, 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 up the efficiency level and driving down our capital cost. So we need to be very careful and very calibrated as to how we use the transparency measures that the government rightly is imposing. But uh, not everything uh, is, is best fit for a Pozoro system. And for sure, um, added uh, duties of 50% are often not... Uh, supportive of the, uh, the upstream uh, production. We also need to make sure 
that we can get to our land, that the allocations in particular for our exploration, that we need to have fast procedures in, in order to get that. So we're calling on uh, support to make sure that we um, reduce the red tape uh, to speed up the cycle of development, uh, because our developments already take long enough, and the faster we can uh, make this and the shorter we can make the development cycle, the more interesting the um, investment cycle uh, will be. And I already actually told you that um, we are discussing at the moment uh, with policymakers uh, and the regulator how we could continue to accelerate the Black Sea. We are ready to take a role to further explore um, and, and shoot seismic and gather data. Um, and we need to work out new regimes of um, uh, allowing us to do so, so that later on we can, on the back of that uh, transparency, we can have better license round or better farm ins and PSA rounds as a next step. So this is in a nutshell, I've not talked about um, uh, storage yet. There was an important question about storage, talking about that part of the business. clear. Storage for us is a strategic asset. We have much more storage uh, capacity than we need for the country and for ourselves alone. Um, we're excited to see how fast we've been able to develop the, uh, the operation and the, the custom warehousing around the storage and to see how in the region traders have uh, embraced that as an uh, opportunity. We'll not have every year the same opportunity. It depends on the market pricing, clearly. Uh, but we are intent to try to work uh, in the region uh, to enlarge in that, um, uh, the sphere of influence of our storages and through um, effective cooperation with the countries around us and integration of our market uh, to make sure that the, the use of that storage will become more and more. Final point on that storage is one of the things that we see at the moment through, for example, uh, Poland um, uh, receipt. Um, the LNG that lands in, in Europe and that finds its way already through massive amount of receiving terminals. I mean, uh, Europe can receive more than half of the volume that it's consuming today through LNG terminals. Um, and we see that that supply into Europe finds its way also to our storage facilities. So in that game, we're playing a very attractive game of uh, turning summer LNG into winter LNG um, for European countries. So we're actually very happy to play part. The role that Ukraine can play in LNG is best played through this mechanism rather than through ideas of building our own terminals uh, because we don't need those terminals and we should not need to invest as a country, not even as Naftogaz, as a country into those kind of activities. We have a lot of gas under the ground. Let's focus on developing that gas. That makes the country ultimately independent and that's what priority number one, two and three from a gas perspective have to be. Okay, I mean, two, we're getting quite a lot of questions now, but two very, very quickly questions, sort of, what is the role of naphtha gas in LNG? And then secondly, in terms of storage, I mean, gas, yes, what about crude, crude oil storage? What's, what's, what's your view on crude oil? Let's take them separate. So uh, it's almost in the question, actually, what is the role of naphtha gas in LNG? We believe that the best role that naphtha gas can play in LNG is through our storage facilities in the market that we see today. If there were somebody to come tomorrow, that say, hey, we give you a permanent discount compared to the European price, and therefore we would like you to have a terminal, and can you actually back this up with a long-term contract? Of course, we will actually support so that. Open. However, I don't believe that any party like that is showing up tomorrow. And let, rest assured, we have experience with long-term contracts. We've also experienced with getting rid of long-term contracts. Um, some of the people here in the panel more than I have even. And um, we will be very careful before we actually step into that. It does look that today's, but also the near-term market, does not need long-term contracts for LNG to land here in Europe. We have more than in, uh, enough of that landing here in Europe. And through our storage and summer-winter activity, we think we can play a very good game into the LNG market. That's probably your most important part. The second part on the uh, storage of oil products, we're working on uh, revamping uh, and uh, further actually upgrading our pipeline system because there's a large amount of capacity that we have in our pipeline system. And we're working uh, that up to make that ready also to be able to store even more volumes than we're doing today. Okay, brilliant. So two areas here. So the, the, the seismic, the geology, uh, the subsoil. So I'm delighted to bring in uh, Roman Opimach, the chairman of the State Service of Geology and Subsoil Survey of Ukraine. Uh, Roman, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Hello, everyone. Good to hear Hi, you. 
Roman, the floor is nice yours. You. Yes, nice to see you. So, Roman, tell us, what, what's uh, the uh, State Geological Service? Uh, I mean, what, what's your view and what next for uh, NAFTA gas in your perspective? Actually, I understand that it's not a, right now is a challenging time for upstream oil and gas industry for sure. And uh, I want to confirm the solid priority of the current government to make uh, Ukraine independent in terms of the energy, energy uh, supply. Also, we understand that one of the ways is to, of course, is, is the increasing of uh, domestic gas production to enhance the energy security of Ukraine. In our perspective, we understand that we are ready actually and we are working uh, consistently on attracting investment in oil and gas upstream, in upstream industry. Uh, last year was uh, pretty productive regarding the uh, licensing rounds. We propose uh, electronic auction, more than 19 blocks, which were grabbed by the different players and also propose the provided uh, arranged uh, production sharing agreement tenders. So more than 10 companies were selected as the winner. Um, among them are private uh, foreign and private uh, Ukrainian companies and also uh, national national uh, players. So this year we are on the same track actually. So we are launching the, as we call it, uh, round uh, second round of licensing rounds. Right now, uh, more than 24 blocks are open in our investment atlas, investment uh, atlas for investment opportunities. Nine blocks were open for auction right now, and uh, this auction are, were already announced. And uh, three production sharing agreement blocks, uh, the tender for three production sharing agreement blocks uh, already took place. Uh, so. Um, we are working uh, to propose new greenfields, not only onshore, but also for offshore. It could be a different uh, way how to deal with that. And we are in a process to discuss it so far. So we are not starting the new licensing rounds. We are trying to find the best way how to arrange it and how to bring maximum value for industry and for Ukraine. Brilliant. Thank, thank you, Roman. And then let, let's move now to, to the money, to the access to, to capital. Uh, Tim Ash. Uh, Tim, what, what, what's, what's the view in London on uh, uh, the NAFTA gas? Uh, firstly, the, the new team, and uh, secondly, the company itself in terms of access to capital. Andre, can I make one quick intervention? One of our experts uh, driving, um, which is not in line with our safety uh, uh, records, can I ask um, to either park or um, uh, shut out, because I had, this hurts me actually to, uh, to watch it this. Uh, uh, we, we can see you in the corner. I don't know if anyone can see you, but... Um, Thank you. Uh, yes. So a, a health and safety uh, measure. Uh, please uh, 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 <laughs> don't, don't drive and zoom at the same time. Uh, so, Tim, uh, I think that, 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 that's a valid point. So, Tim, over to you. It gets a big tick from an ESG perspective from Absolutely. investors that you're so concerned about health and safety of people on this call. That's a great one. Um, you know, I've been covering sort of Ukraine and Africa for a long time. And, um, well, firstly, thanks to Africa for organizing this session today. I mean, it's been really interesting for, for myself and I think anyone else listening in. And it's, uh, it's uh, I think, a reflection of the openness of the country, uh, company and the willingness to engage with investors and and the wider public, I guess. Um, secondly, as I think as, as uh, Vladi Rashkovan also said, I mean, I think the transformation in the company in the you know five, six years since Euro, Euro Maiden has been absolutely extraordinary. And, you know, that's already brought big benefits for Ukraine, massive improvements on the balance of payments, reduced energy imports, fiscal. Remember the quasi-fiscal deficits of Ukraine where about five to six percent of GDP was essentially subsidies to NAFTA gas, they've kind of gone. And as Vladi did say also, the victory in Stockholm, which was a, a huge win for Ukraine. Um, you know, as, as an institutional investor, as a fixed income institutional investor, you know, NAFTA gas used to be uh, a terrible company that we used to engage with, with, with massive red flags waving 
uh, at any interaction we had with a company. And I think it's, you know, it's testimony to how far the company's come that, you know, the success of recent uh, bond issuance by the company and the fact that guys like us want to engage with the company and the fact that, you know, there's, there's real talk about an IPO. A few things, a couple of things I'd, I'd just like to highlight. Firstly, I'm actually joking about ESG. Now, ESG is now central to everything that we do as, as institutional and portfolio investors. So every security that we uh, invest in, we have to have a, an ESG rating. So obviously, as, as mentioned previously, an energy company raises massive red flags. So it's good that the company has, has a well-thought-out ESG strategy. Uh, governance is, is pretty central to that. And, and again, I just going back, I mean, I think the success of the com company in the last five, six years has been critically dependent on the management team. And as has already been mentioned, you know, I think what really concerns us as investors when we look at Ukraine, and, and Ukraine's a credit that, you know, investors have done really well in the last two years. People have made a lot of money investing in fixed income space, whether it's sovereign, whether it's corporates or banks, and even, even local market debt. So it's a credit that people want to invest in. Um, but I think at this, we're, we're at something of a turning point in terms of the country and, and the, the sort of in, the, the success story that we've had in the last four to five years, you know, really is, is hanging a bit on a thread at the moment in terms of, as has been mentioned, the, the salary limits on, uh, on uh, supervisory boards and management teams of state-owned enterprises, whether that's NAFTA gas or state-owned banks. You know, if, if this issue is not addressed, we will see a, a cleansing of capable technocrats from NAFTA gas, state-owned uh, state banks, et cetera. And we're already seeing it, you know, in terms of uh, erosion of institutional capability, I think, in the National Bank of Ukraine, the change of the governor, the failure uh, of the National Board Council, National Bank Council to, to extend the term of Ole Churi is uh, another devastating blow. Uh, and I think across the board, you're seeing, whether it's Ministry of Finance, whether it's Customs Agency, whether it's the Tax Administration, uh, you're seeing, uh, you know, technocrats being driven out of their positions, and I think this this raises, I think, huge question marks on the part of, of investors like myself. You know, whether we want to invest in NAFTA gas will be critically dependent on whether we we think the management team that are in place at the moment and, and look very credible, uh, whether they're still going to be in place in, in a year's time. And you know, I think the question marks must be asked about whether they are actually going to be in place in a year's time given those, uh, those problems around remuneration. Um, I think a very specific issue um, as, as an investor in NAFTA gas, I mean, we've, we've been holders of NAFTA gas bonds uh, for some time. You know, I, I guess the question mark is around the business model. I mean, I think, you know, NAFTA gas historically has been a gas transit company. Um, and I guess looking forward with the difficulties in the relationship with Russia, I know a, a deal has been done around gas transit with Russia, but clearly... Russia has other objectives, and this obviously Nord Stream 2 is, is ongoing. So, you no, know, the assumption has to be that Ukraine's position as a gas transit hub from, for energy from Russia to Europe will be moderated. So, the question is, I mean, what is its, what is its business model, you know, going forward? And, you know, I think it's, uh, it's been positive to hear that, that there's debate within the company and, uh, about what that business model is. But, you no, know, is it storage? We, we, I heard about, you know, competition in terms of European gas storage pace. Obviously, production, you know, production, there is huge potential, but there, there needs to be huge investment. I guess very significant investment in production uh, uh, capability in terms of, um, of NAFTA gas and also Ukraine more generally. So um, for me, I, I'd want assurance in terms of ESG and governance in particular. Um, I want a clearer messaging from management, but also um, governments around NAFTA gas in terms of 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 uh, of the um, of the stability of, of the management team and, and governance around the company in general, um, uh, and, I, and I think I'm there. I mean, I'm not an energy, energy person. Most of you know I'm a macro person, um, and it's interesting to, to input into the debate. But I'm I'm very interested to hear your, your answers to my the questions I've raised. Anyway, thank you. Brilliant. Uh, thank you, Tim. Um, I don't know if we have Sirhi Fursa with us uh, online. I don't think uh, we we do. Um, maybe we can jump into some of those questions. So the political risk, um, you know, we, we put out a statement, the five business associations put out a statement on Friday 
about the, um, the, the pressure, the political pressure on, on the, the central bank. Uh, we, are, we are concerned about the corporate governance um, amongst you know, many, many sectors. What, what, what's, how, do we, how, how do we approach this? We all understand the problem when we understand uh, what is the origin of the problem as we discussed. Uh, and uh, I believe it's very important that all stakeholders, international community, stand up uh, calling things the way they are. Uh, I'd suggest that it's the best recipe and probably is the only one available to make sure that political meddling uh, stays in the past and doesn't go back into state-owned companies. Not only the gas, I'm speaking wider about banks, uh, about other entities. Uh, and uh, it's also important to understand that voices of our opponents are heard very loudly, whereas voices of our supporters and proponents, they're very quiet and very moderate. And uh, I believe that is one of the reasons uh, why uh, backtracking is happening. Uh, I will give you another example uh, of backtracking. Uh, I'm sorry for going back to industry-related matter, but PSO cancellation is also a backtracking, which uh, was, uh, I would say, uh, forgiven to uh, several previous prime ministers. Uh, IMF, international community uh, were um, very, I would say, uh, receptive to ideas that it's not a good time, that prices may go up, price may go down, various political explanations were given. But I am strongly convinced that the real reason of why PSO was maintained in the past is not about uh, political um, appropriateness or taking care of Ukrainian people. It's not the case, it was corruption. And I am open and very blunt about this and I can continue saying this again. Uh, moreover, uh, if you look at the situation which is happening right now, uh, there was a concern expressed by one of the members of the parliament that, uh, firstly, if there is enough money in the state budget uh, to support um, subsidy payments. Well, simple mathematical equation can uh, prove to you in a very easy manner that as long as not all people of Ukraine uh, receive subsidies, uh, which is the case, uh, it always makes sense to uh, create proper market pricing because those people who can afford market pricing, they'll become a source of the state budget. And even before uh, mm, uh, receipt uh, of, oh, sorry, not receipt, but before payment of dividends uh, for the first quarter of this year, payments of taxes by nafta, gas, and various forms exceeded subsidy payments threefold. So from point of view of budget, that's uh, uh, definitely uh, go ahead. Then second point is about control of market prices, that whether uh, prices can grow, whether there is a limit. Well, what people are missing is that some, from the 1st of January this year, there is no uh, cap on pricing the way it was before. Prices are actually fluctuating with the market. There is import parity link. It is not limited by anything. So when, and prices always go up at some point of time, all markets go uh, through cycles. So at this point of time, when that happens, I believe for Ukrainian households, for Ukrainian people, it would be critical to see what they get for this market volatility. And what they should get is freedom of choice, no matter if they live in urban areas or somewhere in Odessa in rural areas. These people have the same rights, they have uh, the same request to be able to choose what they like. And uh, again, maybe I have some too optimistic view, I think our people are totally capable to decide on their own what is good for them and what is bad. Let them make their choice. Okay, we've got like three questions on PSOs, the, the uh, public services um, uh, obligations. One, one very quick question um, is compensation. Uh, how realistic do you believe in ca cash compensation for PSO from the state? Uh, will NAFTAGAS be able to smoothly co uh, operate without this compensation? Basically, what you're asking uh, can it's, be... It's what, what's moving up with us yeah, but, but, but what, the, what the, the audience is asking is basically whether I believe that Ukrainian state will comply with the law that Ukrainian parliament adopted. <laughs> well, yes, I do. I hope they will soon. That's what the law says, so probably that's as, as much as I can add.
Okay, good, thank you. Um, I'm delighted to bring in now uh, Sirhi Fursa, uh, Sirhi Fursa uh, Dragon Capital, uh, observing full ESG. Uh, Sirhi, it's good to see you. Uh, what, what's your view? I mean, we, we heard the view from uh, the access to the markets in London. What, what's your view uh, in Kiev, uh, or I think you're in Kiev, uh, uh, in terms <laughs> of the, the financials on Uh I see, you see, when we're talking about markets, I don't think it's a question about Nafta gas itself or Ukrgas Vodabovani itself, for instance. I think, would mo and Eurobond story shows that investors are quite optimistic on Nafta gas and on all developments that we have seen in Nafta gas for the last five years, significant developments. Because I do remember first time, last, last time in the previous slide when uh, Nafta gas uh, did restructuring of their bonds and now they just. Uh, favorite participant of the market from investors. I think it's quite, quite a macro story. Would be, it, it, it's not a question, is it investors waiting or not for NAFTA gas? It's just a question, is it investor waiting or not for Ukrainian risk? And I think that now is a key question is Ukrainian risk. It will be okay if it will be okay with Ukrainian risk, if investors will be confident that Ukraine are moving in the right direction, in line with IMF, in line with reform agenda, I think they will be happy to participate in every kind of NAFTA gas risk, would be it in IPO in next three, five years on another Eurobond issue. Brilliant. Well, thank you, uh, Sarhi Sarhi Fursa from uh, Dragon Capital. Um, we still have questions. I think um, electricity generation. Um, we had um, uh, a question regarding the, the electricity generation. What, what, what is the role um, of, of NAFTA gas in, in this, both in terms of the, um, uh, the gas, but also in terms of renewables? NAFTA gas um, has uh, entered the renewable market. Uh, we are not a very big player at this point of time, but we have uh, launched uh, into operations uh, already one small assets and two big assets are currently under construction. Uh, so we want to play more in renewables. Uh, however, we are disturbed with the process of renegotiation of renewable tariffs, which is currently going on, which makes our decision making a bit more complicated because we also would like to see clear outcome and clear message from the state how they see tariffs and other conditions going forward. Speaking of generation electricity, uh, also it will very much depend on the health uh, of the um, electricity market, whether uh, market is ready, and we all know that gas is a perfect match for transitions uh, in various countries. It is clean, uh, at least much cleaner than coal. Uh, it is very uh, flexible, uh, can be delivered on demand, uh, and there are other uh, pros to gas compared, for example, to coal, which is heavily used in Ukraine. Uh, but this is where we also would like to see clear guidance from the state. If Ukrainian uh, regulator, if Ukrainian state officials are ready to pay for gas as a more efficient, more cleaner, and uh, I would say more European solution, as soon as the answer is yes, and this communicated to us clearly, definitely enough to gas would consider not only selling gas to generators, which we do right now, but also entering generating capacities. Okay, so moving on from PSOs to PSAs. Uh, Otto, uh, what is the status of the product sharing agreement negotiation with Ukrainian government? Is Vermilion still on board? So far um, that we know, Vermilion is fortunately still on board. Um, it is something we are concerned about. Um, the discussions with the government are in a very active uh, state. Um, over the last uh, three, four weeks, um, I have to say that uh, together with the Ministry of Energy, I think we've uh, upped the game to try to get uh, to a finalization in the solution. It's also clear that with many actors uh, involved also in the government, that is not an easy game. So we're trying to keep actually pushing this very, very hard. And we're calling on um, uh, our, our colleagues in the government to make sure that we are trying as much as possible to stick to the international standards that we see in PSA arrangements um, to make it, I would not say relatively easy, but industry specific 
industry standard to uh, conclude those PSA arrangements. We're keen that we actually um, conclude them. Um, because imagine the next step. Imagine that in the next month we are finalizing uh, the PSA arrangement. Vermilion is actually continuing to recognize the viability of Ukraine, partly because of that, that conclusion. Then we have a partner who is willing and able, capable, and desire to invest with us uh, fast. Um, which means that we can uh, start investing, which in turn is actually very helpful as we try to get the country out of the current crisis as well. So it really is a flywheel that we need to actually get going. Okay, just a very quick follow-up on that. Is UGV still committed to initial CapEx obligations in PSA tender proposals, proposal given uh, the market downturn? We, we are always uh, prepared to the um, uh, CapEx levels that, that we are proposing. There may be some facing in it, but we are not fundamentally moving away from individual PSA commitments or, or not. Um, and um, we are not, uh, we're prioritizing our entire portfolio. And let me say our first and foremost um, uh, uh, focus is to bring our capital expenditure to more efficient levels. So do more with less money. Okay, two questions. For may, may I add one point here? Sure. I, I think it's, it's very important that all of us clearly understand what the PSA deal for Ukraine is about. It's about giving investors uh, opportunity to explore for oil and gas in Ukraine in exchange for commitment that this exploration will be financed. Because if that principle is violated, then we can end up with a bunch of areas in Ukraine which are not explored and are locked in the endless litigations and other process which will block other investors from coming in. So in after gas, we have clear understanding that if we promised money and we, that's how we want tender, then that money should be committed to investments. Otherwise, there is no point for the state and for Ukrainian people to continue with any investor. Uh, I think Vermilion, our partner, is on the same page with us. We hope that PSA contest and um, conclusion of agreement may be finalized in the near future. Uh, it has been now a year since the contest was run in 2019. Uh, and for uh, gas and for our gas production subsidiary UGV, access to new fields, being able to explore and being able to develop bigger, more economically feasible, uh, potentially more uh, um, economically viable uh, structures, that's something we are desperately looking for. Okay, so two questions there addressed to Peter, but uh, anybody can jump in. First, uh, how significant do you uh, think uh, will be the con uh, contribution of additional storage earnings to Naftogaz in 2020, given high inventories and oversupplied states of European markets? And a question similar to that, but uh, again, Peter, could you clarify if there are any legal or any other limitations on foreign players leasing storage space in Ukraine? Are there any changes expected in this area? Let me start with the last question because I find that an interesting question. Um, in itself, there are no limitations. However, in order to operate in Ukraine as a foreign legal entity, you must have trust in the legal system. And it's not so much, I think, about legality. It is about trust in the system. And you come back to what we heard before. This is about investing in a country where people respect agreements that are being made. There's predictability. Because investors have a choice. They can go anywhere they want. And if Ukraine is not predictable and the system they don't feel comfortable or trust in, then they go elsewhere. And in that sense, it doesn't matter whether it's storage or any other investment activity. Right? In terms of the question, will it contribute to our earnings in 2020? The answer is yes, for sure. This is a model that I think is, especially now that we are in a world where we are no longer having the revenues from the transmission business, after all, after the unbundling, that is not part of our P&L anymore. So these are very valuable sources of income. And I think it's not just the income from the underground storage. It is also our ability to trade around these underground storage positions and make money out of that. Okay. 
Um, we've got questions about uh, non-payment. Um, could you update on the situation on non-payment more related to the first panel if Nafagaz expects to be able to collect these amounts uh, after the gas market reform? Um, and a question about dividends. Um, what do you think is the probable level of dividends for a company like Naftogaz in a country like Ukraine? How else can Naftogaz contribute now that gas prices are so low? Our contribution to the state is not just dividends. We also pay income tax. We pay a huge amount of royalties. So I don't think we should just focus on dividends. It is inevitable when gas prices are lower that a company as Naftogaz will remit a lower dividend to the state. Whilst we recognize that at these moments actually the state really needs the money. Right? So it's not us turning a blind eye to what the government needs in a crisis. But at the same time, unfortunately, oil and gas is very cyclical. And that means you will have good years and you have years where the dividend stream will be less than what people expect. Now, the other point to make is that the money that we give back in form of an attractive dividend to the government can only be spent once. Every dollar, every grivna that we make, we either invest in the company or we return to our shareholder. You need to find a balance in that. If we were to remit all our earnings to the shareholder, it means there's little money left to invest in the company. And we all know that oil and gas does require substantial amounts of money every year in order to keep production up, in order to grow. So it's a subtle balance, and we cannot lean just one way or the other way in how we distribute the money that we earn. And if we are looking at what will 2020 give us, the return to the state will be much more in the form of income tax and royalties rather than dividends, because that is the reality. Our receivables play an important role in all of that, because we can have lovely profits, but if people don't pay us, it doesn't help us. You only get real success when the cash is in the bank. Let's not forget the cash pays for the dividend. Right? So that requires constant attention. And I'm pleased to see that uh, we follow this very carefully, of course, and it's an integral part of our business. Um, often that goes hand in hand with enforcing uh, uh, certain legal actions, because we are not a charity. We're here to make money, and people who take gas should pay for it. It's as simple as that. Okay. Uh, I see Roman Opimach uh, would like to make uh, a comment on the PSAs, and then we'll have 30 seconds wrap up from each of the panelists, and then we, we call it a day. Uh, Roman, the floor is on PSAs. Regarding the PSAs, yes, thank you. So I would like to thank for description to Andre and Otto for the description of the process. Definitely the government on the patient and is, have a desire to finalize ultimately this uh, process in a couple of uh, upcoming weeks. And I believe we are in a force to do that. So, and of course, the main goal is to ensure the maximum value for both of the sites and protect their interest in this process. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Roman. So, 30 seconds uh, wrap up, also. Okay. Um, there's, there's the interesting thing of being in Ukraine is uh, working with Ukrainian people and in the Naftogaz as one of the most, if not the most important company in the country. I see there's a huge desire to better understand what Naftogaz is, how we operate. And I'm happy with these kind of sessions where we can explain that. I also see there's a lot of criticism, um, a lot uh, on all sorts of areas. And I think what is, um, I'm actually quite an optimistic person. And I'm here and I'm hoping and expecting to be here also next year, by the way. Um, and I also see a huge amount of opportunities for Naftogaz and for Ukraine by further advancing the hydrocarbon base that it has and actually making the best of the opportunities we have. We have very good people. We are not a third world country. And um, I think the opportunity set ahead of us is uh, phenomenal. And it's a fantastic place to be. And I think that that's a message that we need to 
uh, distribute much more intensively um, because it is a country that deserves to have that distributed. Peter. It is to the government, be predictable, stick to your promises to make the country attractive as an investment opportunity. In turn, we shall ensure that we are fully transparent, we are absolutely open to the dialogue, we are open to new opportunities, and we like to have that debate. But it takes two to tango. Lana. I think we already integrated some foreigners in the European experience in our company, and we deserve to be a, a kind of participant on the European market. I think that we can be an example of successful integration. And definitely here will very much depend on the government and on the transparency in Ukraine. And I hope that all these voices which are raising now, they will be heard and that the company will continue to pass to the Europe. Andrei. I would like also to add to Peter's point that it takes uh, the two to dance the tango, uh, that uh, Nafta gas um, has demonstrated on numerous occasions uh, how much can be achieved for the benefit of the state, for the benefit of Ukrainian people, if you do the right thing. But that also takes courage. And I would very much wish that the state, jointly with Nafta gas, will be courageous enough to finish what remains unfinished, to deliver new victories. Uh, and I believe that even in this difficult and turbulent time, it opens a lot of opportunities, huge opportunities for all of us to succeed. But it also takes courage. Hope the state and us, we all will find. Brilliant. So uh, very big thank you to Peter, Andri, Lana, Otto. And I think the courage, I think it's the time to really demonstrate it. And I think uh, today you had an opportunity to hear from the team that, that is really sort of transforming here in Ukraine. Uh, I think we are living in uh, super exciting times. I think, as, as was said at the beginning, we, we do, do hope that this excitement calms down just a little bit. But um, we are here uh, on the ground in Kiev and um, a lot is happening. So stay tuned. And uh, I think there's more good stories to come. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, thank you to all the Naftogast team for bringing us together. Stay healthy, stay safe, and see you soon.